So while, while I want to thank our eloquent and uh, committed speakers, what we'd really like to do now is open the floor uh, to the audience if you have questions for the speakers or if you simply ha would like to talk back to the panel. Uh, we, 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 we want to hear what you have to say. We have mics set up in the middle there, so uh, please advance to the microphone. And don't all come at once. Well, so a a a as the chair, then I, I, I will uh, start off the discussion. And I, I, I'd like to talk to the panel briefly about, you know, we, we fixate a lot on the elites, and I, th I, th I think that's for good reason. But I was recently in Jasper, Missouri. Uh, uh, I, I was there for a memorial service. It's a small town from which my parents come. And um, people, it was one of the more depressing sights I've seen in a very long time, a rural town of 800 people where, you know, if they had a dollar store, it would be an improvement. Uh, and, and so as we think about the people who are, being, in, in our view, oftentimes being manipulated, who are angry, you know, how do we think about the legitimate resentments of people who, who aren't elite? And, 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 and how do we not only resist the elite, but also reach out to people who who aren't going to know about Cicero and who aren't necessarily going to immediately understand why they should care. Anybody want to take that one? Joy? Yeah, yeah that, thanks. I, think, I don't know if this is on. Yes, good. Um, this is why, and forgive me, I have a cold, obviously, um, <clears throat> if I cough. This is really why I wanted to to focus on, on, on poverty, on precarity, on the ways in which we forget how our experience of, uh, of, of living in a world day to day where we do know how to negotiate the rules um, affects our conception of, of the political from start to finish. So what is it to start to think about engaging in political discourse with people for whom that's not their lived reality? Um, and from the university perspective, I think we have very obvious connections, especially through schools and of different levels and community experiences um, of all types in the arts, um, in, uh, for, for people interested in science, you know, we have, we have labs that people are interested in seeing the insides of. Um, and if they're not interested, we can, again, work through cultural institutions like schools and libraries to, to enliven th that interest, you know, from the ground up. But we need those people in our spaces. And we need to avoid the fear that we often, I think, use as an excuse uh, that will be, you know, that will will be overweening, will be dominating, will be telling them what they need to know. I mean, yes, of course, that's going to be a danger. That's crashingly obvious. But we need to start and acknowledge that, and then say to people, what, what do you want? You're, you're not comfortable in the space. We want to make you comfortable in it. Help, help us understand how you can be comfortable in the space of the university and how you can speak, how you'll have a voice in our space. And that will mean then changing what we do and how we do it. Um, so, that, so that, I think, uh, if it if it's involves teaching our classes in, uh, in public spaces, if it involves uh, making it a priority to come up with events in the department lo departmental level that bring in people uh, from publics we never see, that's what we need to start doing. Thanks. I see we now have people at the microphone, so. Um, just kind of going off of this rural area aspect, a lot of programs require, not require, but kind of expect you to go to places like Greece or Rome and travel to these places to be accepted into a master's program, into a PhD program. And I think that's where the poor aspect of this is kind of coming into play. And also you have to take into consideration the education of rural, rural America, because these people aren't exposed to the vocab and the, uh, you know, the information that we are going to be presenting as classicists. And I don't know 
personally, how we can get over those hurdles, because it is important for us to travel to Greece and Rome. But how do you get a scholarship if you aren't educated enough or you've never had those experiences? That's a wonderful comment, and I would like to roll it back just a little by saying to achieve that and to achieve what Joy has been talking about, there are things that are earlier and deeper that we need to do. One is we need to spend more money on pre-K education, which is expensive but is shown to be the most effective economic way to spend money on education for young people. We need, we need however difficult it is, to move away from basing our local school systems finances on property taxes because the single greatest predictor of the success of any student, no matter what their grades, no matter what their background, of getting into a good college is a five-digit number and that's their zip code. And finally, I hope that more colleges and universities will be able to find it in their finances, however hard it is, to do more need-blind admission and as much financial aid as they can, we are getting an increasingly segmented and selective system of college, which is actually creating a reciprocally reinforcing engine with a broad plutocracy. That is a great danger. We need to break out of it. Thank you. Um, see, this uh, next. Oh, OK, sure. I'm not quite sure how to formulate this. Okay, um, I am wary of anything that so much as smacks of a salvific narrative. I am wary of anything that so much as smacks of a salvific narrative in which we, we who, who, who's the we exactly, um, go out and offer our knowledge to, to, to destitute folks who are in, in, in our own imaginaries conceptualized and spatialized as being out of us not being of us. I mean, even in the language that we use to, to formulate this kind of outreach, the, 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 the rhetorical strategies, the, the deictic qualities of the language we use and insistently label and term and inscribe that other as somehow not us, right? On, specifically on the salvific front, um, I think a fair question to grapple with and one that I think we, we are all in this room sort of collectively working our way towards is should someone in rural Mississippi, or rural Missouri, or anywhere in the rural hinterland, should someone in an urban context, should someone across the street who is destitute care about what we do? Should it matter to them? And if we don't answer that question, then I... I, as I mentioned in the paper, I, 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 the discipline uh, dies, and I'll be quite happy to see it die. Um, for me, it is a matter of ethical urgency to resist and, where possible, disavow the conditioning that has enabled all of us, or many of us at one point to another, to believe that we are autom automatically bringing something of value to these folks who don't have it or who are in need of it. Why can't we instead place an accent on what, what they are potentially giving us? What, what, it, what it might mean in the context of a, of a practice of true mutual recognition uh, is to recognize that they, they are sites of knowledge. And that's what I'm trying to work my way towards. Can I respond? Yeah, thanks. I, I guess, Danielle, I would say two things. And one is that I've, I've, I'm wary of asking people who are I'm, I'm wary of calling people who aren't, who don't have the privilege that I've had, me. You know, I'm, I'm wary. I, I know you're pointing out a, a an, uh, an, the, the limits of a, of an us them dynamic, but if I call people who, you know, living outside the graduate center out of, out of a suitcase uh, on Fifth Avenue, part of me or my history or my experience, I'm, I feel I'm doing violence to them. So. It, I would say there's a temporality to what I was calling for here that I probably didn't underline enough, which is that we have to start somewhere. So if, if I, I can't start by saying we, you know, meaning me and the disenfranchised person literally living on my doorstep, 
I have to acknowledge the, that distance, for a distance that they would insist on, I think. But then, once the invitation is made, I, I want to ag agree with what you're saying, that it w what we're doing, our practice would radically change if we listen and we change ourselves in response to what we hear. And what we would have to understand is that instantly it would not be a matter of us giving what we know to the people who need it. It would be agreeing a fret, you know, from, from fresh ground that there are, there are new knowledges and new exchanges that are going to come into being, exchanges, dialogues, um, that will not be what we imagine. But, yeah. Uh, I want to make sure that we get to more people in the audience who want to speak, too. Uh, thank you. This is just a, kind of a, a comment. I'd, I'd appreciate your reactions. Um, the first speaker had talked about the anti-history, about saying that we are there, they are here. And it, it came up um, in another speaker talking about uh, using the classics to serve lib liberal politics. And I wasn't thinking that that's not what he said he wanted to do, but what he was being accused of doing. And um, I just think it's a danger to use classics to promote some kind of agenda. And I know that's, I'm misinterpreting or you know, not quite understanding maybe what you're saying, but it, it seems to me that in, in classics, I teach ancient and medieval philosophy, um, one of the goals is to teach our students how to understand the other, where uh, Plotinus, for example, looks at the world so much differently than we do or a medieval Arab, the way he looks at the world, or someone like uh, Anaxagoras, when you first tell the, the undergrads about him, they think he's crazy. Um, and if my, I look at it where if my students can understand someone else living in a completely different culture, completely different time, completely different language, and they can gain the ability to really understand the other as other, then hopefully that will give my students the conceptual abilities to understand the other who is their neighbor, who is the person of a different political persuasion, a different religious view. And I look at that as one of the things that we can do as educators uh, you know, to, to help our students and help ourselves. So I just... So that, thanks for that comment. Um, I actually uh, want to own that what I'm doing on my site is using classics to promote what, what I call progressive and inclusive politics. Um, so in that sense, I think the, the, the accusation is fair in that it describes what I am trying to do. <laughs> Whether whether that, um, so then the other part of that is, you know, whether, whether I should do that or not. I think, so the, the origin of the project is coming from a position like the one Danelle is, is articulating, which is that I think that the, the arguments we've made for studying antiquity are becoming less and less persuasive. Uh, apart from the danger the danger of invoking Western civilization sort of feeding uh, white supremacist narratives. <clears throat> That's one limitation of the arguments we've made, but just in a, in a multicultural world, the sort of primacy of one form of culture is it's just, it works less and less well. And so I became interested in, well, what, are, what, what reasons could we come up with to, to promote what we do? And, um, that led me to this idea that let's make, let's make arguments for things that I believe are right and beneficial for our society. And I actually think that the, the questioner's um, goal in your class is to understand the other. That feels to me like a progressive and inclusive political goal. I don't mean that as an accusation. I, I mean it as I actually think that's a that's a, a a value of teaching the past in a in a certain way that I would want to embrace on on my site, and I it doesn't feel apolitical to me. Hi, um, I have a couple comments, I guess. Um, so 
I teach high school at a mostly urban uh, high school, and I recently graduated gradu graduate school. So I felt your papers were very persuasive in that I sort of have been wrestling sort of every day with my own, like, you know, you hear 12-year-olds say, well, why do we have to do this? Like, why, do I, why should I care, right? Um, so I took your points very, you know, uh, I guess personally. Um, but I also wanted to make a comment and say that I think we should be careful when we talk about classics um, and we try and think about purity and inclusion and exclusion, um, especially when it comes to safe spaces and trigger warnings. Because when you say that safe spaces or trigger warnings are actually hindering, you're actually cutting people out of a conversation, right? I don't want to uh, read The Rape of Lucretia without giving my students, who are 12 and 13, some warning that this might be uncomfortable. And especially because I don't know anyone's personal life or traumas, I don't want them to disassociate. I want them to engage with the material. So I actually think that safe spaces and trigger warnings are a key. And I agree with Danelle that yes, like if we disagree that this is a problem, then I would like this iteration of classics to die, as it were. Thanks. Should I? Yeah. Um, since I use those phrases, let me just say something really quickly. I, I don't want to. I really don't want to get into a debate about about safe spaces and trigger warnings. Um, partly because I think that my point is that that's dominant. That's taken up so much of our time when I when I believe that we need to put more of a priority than we have as academics, and I include students when I say academics. Uh, on thinking about how to make the we a reality. I mean, how to create an inclusive we that isn't, that isn't splinter groups that figure out complicated rules by which they can talk to one another, but rather is, is a we. And it's gonna take a long time. I'm not saying this is an instant, instant uh, solution. But, um, but I, 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 I want academics to spend more time talking about how we can talk to each other rather than restricting language. Which, which isn't to say talk about restrictions or awareness, this is why I mentioned decorum, isn't crucial. It is. You know, Cicero says the man who neglects how other people think of him is not only arrogant but careless. And, so, and I believe that fundamentally. Yeah. Hello. Just a bit of context, I was trained in elite institutions and I teach in a very non-elite one um, in which um, white students are no longer a majority. So it's majority minority now. Um, my question has to do with connecting an issue from the first paper to the last. Um, it has happened in my classrooms more with biblical studies than with anything classical. I teach, I'm a religious studies scholar in a philosophy department. That uh, students whose worldview could accurately be characterized as anti-historical, anti-history, um, want a seat at the table and want views that are demonstrably false. I'm not even talking about values, but just fact. Um, things of the order of, you know, whether Frederick Douglass is still alive, <laughs> that type of error. Um, and I'm curious if the panel this thing, and you really have different views. Does, uh, let's just shorthand this as an anti-history person. Is that a view in the classroom that I am to, we are to look at as someone bringing a new knowledge or a different knowledge that must be treated somehow on par um, with what I think most of us would still think of as facts and how we find them out or construct them? That's my question. Johanna, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, I think that's a really difficult question. I think it's a really interesting one. And the question, you know, specifically about whether we should treat that form of knowledge as on part. I mean, I think really both yes and no. And and I, I, I haven't, I didn't think about my material pedagogically. This is sort of a new thing. Thing that I'm thinking about, but I, I do think that um, I mean pedagogical praxis. That that's 
I think that question is beyond my where I've gone thought wise and where I have my you know what I would consider my sort of what I feel comfortable really commenting on. But I you know one of the things I was trying to argue in my paper is that I do think that you know there is a move towards the um, anthropology of history. This is there's a whole special issue of a um, how an anthropological journal dedicated to this last year. Well, now 2016. Um, that is sort of really trying to open up that area to study the study of different forms of construction of historical knowledge, sort of different ways that different people and different groups sort of construct an ontology of historical knowledge. So I, I, mean, I guess I would say that in this very inchoate form, I, I, I don't think that that is something that collectively or that I would want to sort of completely dismiss out of hand as as a way of looking at things, but it's one that I guess what I'll say I'm comfortable with at this point is it's one that I would want to know more about. Let's just say one thing. Yeah, I thought that was a great question too, and it's a really hard one. But I, it, in at least one point I was trying to make in my uh, paper was, or one reaction I have is that that the the fact that Frederick Douglass is dead, or the non-fact that he's still alive, um, I would. When she said I would want to know more about, it, I think the way I would approach it in the classroom is I instead of talking about that fact or non-fact, I'd look at the argument that that statement is being used as a part of. Like, why did the why did the person say that? What are they trying to demonstrate? Um, because I because I. Because I think that the, f the fact itself is not very significant. And that if you, in the sense that once, I think once you look at what it's, what's, suppo what's supposedly proven by the invocation of that fact, what argument is being made by the invocation of the fact, that's where, the, that's where it'll be pretty easy, I think, to find a problem. Um, and so that's not saying that that's not saying that you just let it in as a form of knowledge, but there's a way of there's a way of then examining like to what argumentative use is that claim being made, um, which which would sort of show I think what a kind of dead end arguments that start from positions like that are. The questioner uh, also spoke about religion. It's, it's an important issue, uh, and we don't talk about it enough, I think. Well, one of the ways, I think, to talk about religion is to talk to a person about the tradition that they know and understand and learn about it and try to open them up to other traditions as well because it turns out that most religious traditions don't always agree on everything even in that tradition and that there are very significant differences. Say, even among American evangelicals, there are significant differences. And we speak of them as homogeneous groups, and they are not. And the more that one looks at their history as well, the more that one sees that their tradition has been a development through history. So I think there's an opportunity there. I think respecting what someone else believes is terribly important, but I think discussing it is also uh, very valuable. Uh, thank you all so much, um, and uh, I'm inspired by Donnell here to be provocative. Uh, so in the vein of you stirring the pot, uh, let me come back at you. Uh, so to come back to the question of who are we, uh, and to pick up on the, the statement by the woman who just spoke before me, uh, and I don't offer this as a criticism or an accusation, but the five panelists here are teach in New Jersey, Rhode Island, New York, and Boston. Massachusetts. Uh, there's nobody from the middle of the country. There's nobody from the West Coast. There's nobody from across the pond. Um, most of you are at Ivy League or elite liberal arts colleges. Uh, so there's a huge swath of our own membership. And, and again, I'm not offering this as a criticism, but this tends to happen each year, that there are certain schools uh, that are privileged uh, over others. Uh, and I'm one of these people who also went to elite universities and now teach at the University of Nebraska, uh, where we have terrific students and I have terrific colleagues. 
but I think there's a, there should also be room for our discipline to reflect the plurality of we um, conceived of in other ways when we have these conversations. So let me ask you this question, Danelle. Uh, if the discipline should die, where should it die? Should it be alive in the middle of America? Should it be alive in the oldest universities in the country? I would, I mean, I, I would like to see it be alive in Nebraska because I want a job. Uh, <laughs> but I also think, uh, you know, my, my students, I try not to do too much arm twisting, but I have to do some arm twisting because our administrators are bean counters and they want to see numbers. So if I don't twist arms, if I don't get majors, we can't make the case that we need a replacement line. Um, but at the same time, the students love this. I mean, they love this stuff, right? Classics is awesome. It's a lot of fun. How can you not fall in love with, um, I don't know, like weird myths? How can you not fall in love with chariot racing? So <laughs> if we kill the discipline, then we potentially close off uh, the sort of access to that, just that fun stuff for the students. Uh, you know, mind you, I'm not making any high-minded high argument about the value of creating citizens, though I think we all probably believe that. Um, so yeah, so where should the discipline die? I, I'm just going to take the chair's privilege and point out I am from the University of yeah, South I know. Carolina. Well, that's, why I was, that's why I was looking over here. <laughs> oh, I know. That's why I was looking over here, not over here, because I recognize that. You were going to undermine I'm a, my argument. I'm an accident. <laughs> <laughs> with, with thanks to uh, my Stanford cohort mate for this question, <laughs> and, and, and fellow co-editor. Um, so the, the seed for this, this paper um, was planted uh, a few years ago when I was teaching in Columbia's core curriculum. And as for one of the first sessions of, of CC, of Contemporary Civilizations, uh, the truest of, of true misnomers, I, I asked my students to try to reflect critically on why they were in the room. And one of them said, well, you know, to, to be honest with you, I thought that this was a great way of learning about text uh, that I could then bring up in cocktail conversations. I appreciate the honesty. I thought it was worthwhile that he uh, uh, was, was that blunt about it, right? So I, I, I bring this up uh, to approach what I think is a, 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 not a terribly well-formed answer to your question, but that would certainly be the springboard for a more fully developed answer to your question. And it also relates to the point you raised about the composition of this panel, which is that if it is to die, and uh, I, I would like to see it die in these contexts and in these settings where the traffic in classics is a, a means of exchanging commodity among elites and a means of uh, foregrounding a credentialized status uh, that is conducive to, facilitative of, uh, and implicated in the perpetuation of certain hierarchies that I find loathsome. That is the answer to that. Now, as I see it, there are cool things in classics, sure. They're cool to me because I've been socialized and conditioned into thinking they're cool. Uh, it, it, it is not self-evident why if push came to shove, the coolness of things in classics should take precedence over the coolness of things in other disciplines, right? And there are many things that can absorb our students uh, and for which we might make our, heck, you know, I, I spent part of Christmas break playing Zelda. Zelda is incredible. It's, I mean, this richly elucidated imaginative universe, and I want all my students to play Zelda now, right? Um, and if someone were to say, you know, it's, it's time to imagine a whole curriculum around, around, around Zelda or video gaming or whatever, I, I would support this because I think this is good. But I mean, this is, I, I, I bring up the Zelda example only to point out um, that we have, there are many, many catalysts for this kind of, of high absorptivity, high exhilaration. Um, exposure that we can give to our students, that can give them a way uh, to renegotiate and recalibrate their, their selves and their identities in the world. Why we should privilege classics over any of a number of other potential catalysts uh, is, I think, a question that needs to be opened up. Now, yes, we're all, we, we all have skin in the game, right? We all, we all want jobs, this is great. Um, but if, we are, if we're truly in the business of decentering ourselves, uh, and then we have to 
begin by constructing universes in which our jobs and our security and our professional identities as classicists are no longer in existence. So what would that universe look like? And what would our students be riveted by and captivated by? What, how would they form their identities and how would we form our professional identities without classics? If we are going to answer questions about why we do classics and what strategies we employ to argue on behalf of classics, then I think it's, it's, a, it's important to start from a, with a vision of a world in which the discipline has gone away like smoke, right? And then to work backwards um, to reconstruct a more supple and versatile understanding of what it is that we bring. I think that's an important question and a, an important answer. And I mean, one thing that I would add is that I think that the kind of what's being put in opposition here is not classics, is not sort of sitting and reading and talking about Greek and Roman texts, but I think what we're really talking about killing, which I would be perfectly happy to see die, is the fantasy that classics is the arch humanistic discipline, is a sort of fantasy that space that it occupies within the academy. And I think that one of the reasons this is so hard and this is sort of reflective of a general period of transition where a lot of people are rethinking their, their positions of, of privilege. I mean, what does it mean then to be white when you're not gonna be on top all the time, right? This is a similar kind of almost you know threatening, what does it mean to get rid of this fantasy that classics is better than the other humanities, it's sort of more rigorous, Right, that's so, and I, I think that to a certain extent then, that, that's the, and a, a lot of us were drawn into the discipline, I think, because of that fantasy. I certainly was. Um, so what I, I mean, perhaps in, in a more kind of moderate version of, of Denel's proposal is that I think that w what I am very interested in seeing explored is sort of what would a, a classics look like without that, that kind of imaginary, this sort of, um, you know, if we were kind of just another discipline, because we've always enjoyed that extremely sort of, yeah, privileged position, as Danielle was saying. So what, what happens if we just are willing to kind of take an equal step with other humanistic disciplines, then, then what would happen? And I'm sort of maybe very curious to see. Thinking, thinking about the, the work I'm doing on the appropriations by hate groups, I, this is just an inchoate thought I've had, but I've, I've sometimes wondered if, the, if one, reason to, one reason to study classics that's a different reason than for studying something else. <laughs> what if that reason, what if one of those reasons is not that classics is better in some way, but that because evil people think it is better. So, so we're butting up against uh, the presidential reception. Uh, we could, if there's one final comment from the audience, we could take that. That's modus and regos. <laughs> if, uh, yeah, Kathleen. Thank you very much. I'm um, Kathleen Coleman, and I'm from Africa. And we have to start where we are. And for me, the purpose of classics is being in a classroom in apartheid South Africa with my black students and my white students in the same classroom, and we could discuss slavery because it was so far away, the ancient world in time and space from every person in that classroom that we were on a level playing field. And that I will take with me to my grave as the justification for why we do what we do. Thank you. Thank you. I really can't think of a better note for us to end on, so thank you all. <laughs>